You've all heard the statistic, 50% of marriages end in divorce. But is that number real? And if it is, what can you do to keep your marriage from becoming part of that statistic? If you're struggling in your relationship, today's show is for you. It was this headline that caught our attention. Five signs you need marriage counseling. What are the five signs? What if you only have one of them? What if you have all five? We asked the author of this article, a relationship expert, to sit down with us and tell us everything we need to know about marriage and relationships and how to know if you should double down on trying to make it work or if it's time to walk away. All that and more ahead. Hello and welcome to Prescription for Life. I'm Monica Robbins and today is for all the lovers out there and those who want to love and those desperate to make their love work. 50% of Americans over the age of 18 are married. Another 7% are cohabitating with a partner. Four out of 10 marriages are actually remarriages. And the number one reason couples say they made the decision to walk down the aisle? love. No one enters into a relationship with the intent for it not to last. And when you hit some obstacles, it can be a very lonely road to walk. And all the experts will tell you that communication is key. But what does that even mean? You think you're communicating very clearly, right? But are you communicating in a way your partner actually hears and understands you? We're going to talk to our expert in just a minute, but first, a look at the different love languages from our Minneapolis station. See which one speaks to you. You love your kids. You love your doggy. You love Chicago dogs and pizza. Neapolitan for me, love that. You love that car. You are in love with your partner. Love, that's a tricky word. Well, I think we use the word love in so many ways, it's hard to know what a person means by what they say. Dr. Gary Chapman, a decades-long marriage counselor, kept hearing these same misunderstandings couple after couple. He had his own doubts in his own marriage. I remember what it's like to be married and think I married the wrong person. This is not working out. We're too different. It's never going to work. That's until he poured over years of his marriage counseling notes and refined them, creating five reoccurring themes of communicating love. Five love languages starting with words of affirmation. One of the things I like about you is, it's just using words to affirm the person. Quality time. Giving the person your undivided attention. Gifts. It's universal to give, give and receive gifts as an expression of love. Acts of service. Doing something for them that you know they would like for you to do. And physical touch. We've long known the emotional power of physical touch. That's why we pick up babies and hold them and kiss them and cuddle them. His book, The Five Love Languages, has been published in 50 spoken languages, selling more than 12 million copies in 25 years. So everybody picks one and they go, oh, that's me. Yeah. Can you just have one first or can you have two or how did the combos work? Well, there are people who say to me that they think two of them are just about equal, you know, for them. Yeah. And my response is fine. We'll give you two love languages. We'll call you bilingual. My wife is a 2-4 combo, right? So like, I lose without question, quality time and acts of service. The book has become so ubiquitous. <laughs> we thought you might appreciate their take. We've got long tenured marriages standing. On their love languages at home, not work. That'd be weird. My sister sent this to everybody in our family. And what I find interesting is... What does that say about your family? We need this. <laughs> what I care about, and it honestly is out of all these, it is time. Well, probably quality time. Whereas I am more of a words of affirmation. Like, I, my ego is so insatiable it can't be fed enough, right? I, That's not true. It's not. It's not true at all. Quality time, acts of service. He's very good about compliments and telling me he loves me, which is great. But I'm like, how's that dishwasher? <laughs> <laughs> what has made this book 
so powerful to so many people for so long? I think it's because it addresses that deep human need to feel loved by the significant people in your life. And I think it's helped couples learn how to express love and how to keep emotional love alive in the relationship. You're saying it sticks around because it works. I think so. Chris Sarapsky, CARE 11 News. So you may be wondering, can this relationship be saved? Well, it turns out the seven year itch isn't totally true. Research shows most divorces happen after just four years. And if you're wondering, is it time for couples counseling? Well, we have our Cleveland Clinic expert to answer your questions. We are joined now by Cleveland Clinic clinical psychologist, Dr. Adam Borland, talking about marriage. We have heard this statistic so many times that 50% of marriages end in divorce. Is that true? You know, the research kind of varies. Marriages obviously can uh, have difficulties and unfortunately cannot be saved. And yes, divorce happens. I think that the research, though, can can be difficult to, to kind of pinpoint. But I would guess there's a lot of things you probably have to think of before you get married. Um, what are some warning signs, red flags that maybe you're not supposed to marry this person? You know, I think it's very easy to kind of uh, stay in that honeymoon phase and you tend to ignore maybe some some warning signs in terms of different values, different beliefs, uh, recognizing that maybe we originally came together based on some activity or something that 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 uh, bound us together. And maybe that's not necessarily healthy. And as our marriage um, kind of unfolds, we recognize, you know what, there needs to be some changes here. So you wrote an article for Cleveland Clinic, five signs that indicate you probably need marriage counseling. I'm going to kind of just roll through them. Uh, the first one, lack of emotional or physical intimacy. Is this like when you feel like a roommate? Very much so. I often have uh, couples who say that we walk by each other in the hallway and it almost feels like a coworker. We'll check in with each other and that's about it. And you know, the, the stress of family, the stress of finances and work, there's not time carved out to be a couple again. So is that how you got to fix it? You got to make date night or? Date night can certainly uh, help. I think it's first the recognition on both from both parties that, hey, we're kind of missing something here, right? That, that there's that, that that close bond seems to have kind of vanished. And I would think complaining is not the way to start that conversation. It doesn't help. It doesn't help. And it's very common to finger point. And so that's where we work on kind of, kind of the idea of I'm going to take ownership of my feelings, share them with you. And then how can we find some middle ground? You struggle to communicate. Yes. That seems like a no brainer. Yes. And that really goes for, for any relationship, the importance of communication when it comes to a marriage or a long term relationship, that communication is so important. Um, and it's it's unfortunately the, the small things that tend to kind of get blown up in, into bigger things because we don't communicate. We tend to keep them bottled up. Sign number three is uh, this is like the one that will, of course, trust has been broken. Yes. But is this just like, you know, you cheated on your spouse physically or is this can trust be other issues as well? Oh, sure. It, it can be, especially with the Internet and social media, you know, there can be all sorts of different uh, breakings of trust, um, not just the, the physical dynamic. And I see that a lot in my practice. And once that uh, seed has been planted, it's very difficult to kind of regain that trust. And that's where marital therapy can hopefully be beneficial. So I think a lot of people discount that emotional cheating. Mm -hmm. How is, are you seeing that skyrocket lately? I am. Why do you think that is? I think it's the ease of, again, internet usage, social media. Um, I, I, think, I think there is just a sense of, of maybe loneliness um, and that people are looking for a connection that maybe they're not getting from their partner. Another sign you've gone through a major life change. Are we talking just having kids or? 
Now, not, not just having kids, we can uh, talk about relocation, we can talk about the loss of a loved one or someone close to you, um, financial dynamics, you know, whenever there's a, a big spike in terms of, boy, this, this is a big change in life, you really want to look at, at our, you know, are we a partnership here? Are we dealing with this together? And sign number five, one of you struggles with addiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's all sorts of different addictions, and I've seen this in my practice. Um, for instance, someone who, let's say, is dealing with a gambling um, addiction, and then it causes significant financial consequences to the family. And unfortunately, these are often hidden from the partner. And so marital therapy can certainly be beneficial. So we know big life stressors. You mentioned finances. We know kids, politics these days. But what are the most common reasons you're hearing for divorce? It, the communication, communication, communication. It, that always seems to be kind of the, um, the leading reason why people have kind of distanced. And so that's where marital therapy can really help bridge that gap. When you have that neutral third party who can say, here's what I'm seeing, right? And you're not necessarily really listening to each other. What about what people who may be afraid to take that first step? You know there's a problem, you haven't talked about it, but you're afraid if you say something or even mention maybe we need counseling, you're gonna have an exploding fight. Yeah, because uh, mental health therapy is still, unfortunately has somewhat of a stigma to it. And thankfully that's changing, but I think it is not uncommon for one partner, let's say, to, to be hesitant and to think, no, I don't need this, or, or simply I refuse to do this. And I think that's where, if there can be kind of a gradual introduction to therapy and recognizing we don't jump into the deep end of the pool, right? We gradually enter. And that can really help with, with anxiety and negative feelings about therapy. One of the things I've seen a number of times is that women tend to expect the man to be able to read her mind. Mm -hmm. You know, I always say they have they have ESPN, not ESP. And um, how do you how do you get that message across? You know, I've been with him for twenty some years. He should know, and it goes and it goes both ways. It does. She should know what what I'm looking for, what I'm asking for. How you know that comes down to communication. How do you deal with that? How do you you know kind of get people to understand? Nobody can read anybody's mind. Yeah. Mind reading is a very common source of anxiety. And unfortunately, in, in a long term relationship, it becomes kind of routine, right? As you said, we've been together long enough. He or she should know this is how I'm feeling. Should is a loaded word. Should sets expectations, right? I should be up here. Unfortunately, it's down here. And that gap in between causes a problem. So what I often recommend is let's set it as a goal rather than a should. So instead of he should know how I'm feeling, my goal is to help him understand this is how I'm feeling. And then we can work on that together. So what's your advice for that conversation starter for people who maybe, you know, they're, they're just hesitant to bring it up. Yeah. How do you bring that up? Because you know, like talking about emotional or lack of intimacy, that's not always a, an easy discussion to have, especially with older folks. Sure. Yeah. Again, I think it's the idea of taking ownership of those feelings. This is how I'm feeling rather than finger pointing. It's very easy to say, you don't do this or you don't treat me this way. Rather taking ownership, I'm feeling hurt. I'm feeling as though you're not seeing me or you're not hearing me because the, can't, the other person can't necessarily dispute how you're feeling. Right. But when it comes to finger pointing, there's a natural defense mechanism. So how do you think marriage counseling is becoming more popular is and and if so, mm -hmm. what's the success rate? So thankfully, I alluded to earlier the idea of uh, the stigma of mental health. Thankfully, that that's finally changing. Um, so, yes, marital and individual therapy are, are becoming much more accepted and people are seeking the services. Um, uh, on a much more common basis. Again, it's difficult to pinpoint the success rates. I think I've read somewhere along the lines that it can be over 70% 70, 70 beneficial. 
But again, it's not a one size fits all. It's based on what each couple brings to the therapy, their effort, and how much they're willing to work as a team to improve the relationship. I've also heard this, that, well, she picked the therapist, yeah. so the therapist is gonna be on her side. How do you go about finding a neutral marriage counselor? That is not an uncommon dynamic for one partner to feel like I'm, I'm on the outside and I'm being kind of ganged up on. You know, finding a therapist, frankly, these days can be difficult. The, the need is tremendous and, and uh, we are, <laughs> we're trying our best to meet all the needs. Uh, there are resources, the American Psychological Association, the Ohio Psychological Association, the Cleveland Psychological Association, all have um, search engines to, to find a therapist. You can also just contact your insurance to see uh, who's available. Uh, there might be a wait list, unfortunately. Yeah, and do that together though, do to it make together. it fair. So what is your one piece of advice that you wish all couples would hear if they're struggling? Oftentimes couples overlook gratitude. Let's focus on the good things. It's very easy to look at the negatives these days. We're living in a highly stressful and, and in difficult times and we overlook the good things. And I think as a couple, if you can recognize, look at all the wonderful things we have in, in our life, that's something to build off of. I, I also wonder, we get caught up, we're so busy with other things in life that sometimes we forget what our partner has done for us. Yes. And, and just a simple saying, thank you, I can go a long way. All right, Dr. Borland, thank you so much for your insight and being with us today. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Lots of good information there and a little more wisdom. This one coming from the younger generation. Could millennials actually have found the secret to success when it comes to a happy marriage? What they're doing differently than generations past. Take a look at this report from our station KTVB in Boise, Idaho. There is good news when it comes to the state of marriage. The divorce rate is dropping. For years, it had been increasing, skyrocketing in the 1960s and 70s. But the latest census data shows a pretty big drop, 18% between 2008 and 2016. At least one study says that's thanks to millennials. The study found millennials are waiting to marry until they're older, when careers and finances are more stable, which experts say could can lead to more stable marriages. But there's something else we can learn from millennials. They go to therapy. I think a lot of younger people, because they don't feel nearly the same stigma that older people do, will seek out marriage counseling much earlier they kind of expect to have some rough patches in their relationship. Wendy Barth, who specializes in marriage counseling and couples therapy, says 75% of her clients are millennials. They're not as averse to help. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad thing, so they'll come in sooner and take preventative measures so that they don't get to a bad place. Compared to the average couple who waits six years before turning to a professional for help which means really six years of resentment, six years of, you know, really unhappy times. A lot of buildup. A lot of buildup. Infidelity, finances, lack of intimacy, and family issues are some of the leading reasons for divorce. But Barth believes there's more to it. Those tend to be maybe the, the trigger for the, the argument, but really it still comes down to the emotional safety issue and what each person is feeling underneath the worry, the fear. So a lot of times couples are continuously having the same argument over and over again, how to load the dishwasher, something silly like that. <laughs> and it's really not about the dishwasher. It's about, you know, are, do you care about me? Barth says just as an infant or child needs a strong attachment bond with their parent, couples need a sense of security and emotional safety with the person they love the most. Whenever that's out of whack, um, people tend to start to protect themselves from hurt and rejection and abandonment. Most of the time there are just two people that have started to get rigid and defensive and, and those kinds of traits as they develop over time can lead to the demise of the marriage for sure. Um, being angry as a means of protecting yourself from getting hurt 
you know, being shut off, um, stonewalling your partner, those are things that have been researched that will predict the demise of a marriage. Well, that's all for this episode of Prescription for Life. I hope you learned a little something on relationships today. And maybe the most important tip we can give you while you're busy loving your partner, don't forget to give a little love to yourself too. We'll see you right back here next week. Until then, I'm Monica Robbins wishing you good health.